direction of the other bonds, so it's only when it's attached to the other endomeric? We're only describing the, the, the glycosidic bond, and that's correct. Okay. Uh, let's see. And here we go. Lactose, sucrose. This is a very dumb structure for sucrose. I'm going to ask you to memorize sucrose. I'm going to give you a much easier to remember structure. The reason this is dumb is it's written as a mirror image of this guy right here. That's actually carbon number two right there. The way we've been writing carbons is so that one and two are on the right side. Here's number two on the left side. We haven't seen that. So don't, underline don't, memorize this structure. Though it's correct, it'll confuse you. Okay, so I'll show you a structure in just a minute. Now, what should you know here? Well, disaccharides, first of all, contain two sugars. You should know that lactose contains two sugars, and you should know what sugars they are. Galactose and glucose. They're linked by an alpha, I'm sorry, a beta 1,4 linkage. I'm an alpha, a beta 1,4 beta one linkage. You're not going to have to draw it because I'm not going to ask you to memorize galactose. But you should know what comprises lactose. Lactose is known as milk sugar because it's a disaccharide that's very common in milk. It was lactose that the E. coli bacterium was trying to metabolize, if you recall. Sucrose contains one molecule of glucose and one molecule of fructose. And again, I'm going to show you a better structure for that in a second. It's an alpha-1-2 linkage. The other ones here I don't think are quite so important. They're not nearly as essential for us to understand. Okay? All right. Um, now, lactose intolerance. I frequently get questions. What's lactose intolerance? What does that mean relative to what we're talking about here? Lactose intolerance uh, is a real life phenomenon, and it happens um, increasingly as people get older. Increasingly as people get older, there's a slight, uh, slightly greater pre prevalence among Asians than among other populations. But anybody in any ethnic group can, in fact, have lactose intolerance. What does it, what does it mean? Well, when we drink milk, we make an enzyme that is called lactase, L-A-C-T-A-S-E. And lactase breaks down glucose, I'm sorry, breaks down lactose into glucose and galactose, its constituent, its constituent sugars. Lactose intolerance arises in people who don't make lactase. Well, why don't you make lactase? It seems like it'd be a good thing to do. Well, lactase makes a lot of sense when you're an infant because you're drinking milk, right? Only in modern evolutionary time have we, as adults, been drinking milk. Over evolutionary time, okay, adults didn't drink milk, and so there was no reason to make lac lactase as you got older. So what we see is a sort of an evolutionary relic of that. We do continue to make lac lactase, particularly as we continue to drink milk, eat ice cream, and things like that. But it, it's, its production may well go down as we get older, and you may develop more lactose intolerance as a result of that. One of the ways they treat it is by either drinking milk that doesn't contain lactose, giving people milk that doesn't contain lactose. And some children have this, by the way, so it's not strictly an adult phenomenon. Um, giving people uh, um, milk that doesn't contain lactose or giving people an enzyme, lactase, that helps them to break down lactose. What happens in lactose intolerance is because um, you don't break it down. It goes into your digestive system as lactose, and it gets into a part of your digestive system uh, unbroken down, and the bacteria that are in that part of the digestive system love it, and they produce a lot of gas, a lot of gas. Okay. So one of the byproducts of uh, lactose intolerance is a lot of gas and pain associated with that. So it can be a fairly debilitating a thing because you're just not breaking any of it down as it's making its way through your system until it gets to the wrong place. And then it's broken down by bacteria. Yes? So lactase breaks lactose down into galactose and glucose. That's the two things that make up lactose. And is it lactase with a C? Lactase with an A-S-E, L-A-C-T-A-S-E. Yes, sir? Orally, it would go in orally. Where would you acquire lactose? 
Um, I think that it's available in like capsules, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I believe you can get it as capsules. Yes? Yeah, it's a good question. Lactase is going to be present in any animal that nurses. Uh, well, if, if their mother makes lactose. So for example, uh, I learned recently goat's milk apparently doesn't contain much uh, lactose. So I would suspect you would find very little uh, lactase in baby goats. But if the mother produces lactose in her milk, then you will, you will see that. And what was the other part of your question? Is it the exact same? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so in, in general, you'll see among all higher organisms, when you see one protein, you'll see a very related protein among all of them. So the lactase that we would make would be very similar to the lactase that a cow or a calf would make or something. So it would be very similar to it. Okay. All right. Sucralose. Now, when I talk about sugars, one of the things that always comes up are artificial sweeteners. I'm going to tell you a story here that um, is... If I told you the story about the insecticide, did I tell you about this or not? I did tell you this. Okay, all of a sudden I realized perhaps I have told the story. Okay, so this was the insecticide. Sucrose that you put a chlorine on. The idea being that perhaps you will keep the, cell, the body from breaking this down, which is exactly what happens. When you don't break it down, the energy that's in there is not available. This guy tastes sweet as hell. And there's that carbon chloride bond that I say I worry about a lot. Okay. Carbon chloride bonds you don't really find in nature. You find it in dioxin, but you don't find it much in nature. And so um, just on that principle alone, I have concerns about sucralose. Okay. Uh, it would take a lot of energy to break that bond, but more importantly, it would take enzymes to break that bond. And you don't have enzymes because the, your body has never been exposed to that before. So. Yes, uh, Casey. Do other alternative sugars have this? The answer is no, they don't. So NutraSweet, for example, is a uh, dipeptide. Or I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, it's a dipeptide. It's got two amino acids linked to each other. It doesn't look anything like this. Okay. Well, we're moving right along through here. Let's turn our attention to polysaccharides. Okay, so polysaccharides, as its name suggests, are, contain many sugars. I gave you a term the other day. I said oligosaccharides. That's sort of in between disaccharides and polysaccharides. Oligosaccharides contain up to about 10 or so sugars. So when I talked about that identity tag on the last exam, that was an oligosaccharide that was on the surface of the cell. And it had anywhere from 6 to 10 or 12 um, sugar residues on it. A polysaccharide has many. It may have hundreds, it may have thousands of sugars. Okay. Typically, they have repeating bonds, and you can see that going on right here. Okay. This is amylose. Amylose is a polysaccharide. It contains only glucose. The glucoses are linked by alpha-1,4 linkages. Alpha-1,4, 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 alpha-1,4. Amylose is made by plants. And it's a component of starch. It's not starch. It's a component of starch. So starch is more than one thing. Starch contains amylose. It also contains a related compound called amylopectin that I'll, I'll explain to you in a minute. Alpha-1,4 linkage. All that, all that amylose has are glucoses linked by alpha-1,4 linkages. Question? A-M-Y-L-O-S-E. Amylose. Okay, as I say, it's a plant sugar, uh, a plant uh, form. And why do we have polysaccharides? Well, one of the reasons that we have polysaccharides and one of the reasons organisms like plants have polysaccharides is to store glucoses, to store energy. Okay? We have a polysaccharide in us called glycogen that I'll explain uh, in a little bit. Plants also have polysaccharides that they use for structural purposes. So 
not every polysaccharide is there to store energy. Plants use cellulose in their cell walls to give structural integrity to them. And cellulose is also a polymer of glucose. We'll see how it differs in just a minute. But most polysaccharides are there for storing energy. Not all of them, but most of them. OK, let's look at cellulose since I just mentioned it. Cellulose um, is a polymer of glucose. Instead of being alpha-1,4 linkages, we have beta-1,4 linkages. That simple change has a drastic effect. Okay. We cannot, as human beings, digest cellulose. The reason that plants are roughage to us is that we eat them, and those polymers of glucose in the form of cellulose don't get digested by our digestive system. And they don't get digested by the bacteria in our digestive system. And as a consequence, they pass through us. Okay. To break down cellulose requires an enzyme known as cellulase. So cellulose is C-E-L-L-U-L-O-S-E. -L -L -E. Cellulase, replace the O with an A, and you've got the enzyme that breaks down cellulose. Now, of course, some animals can break down cellulose. Anything that you see out grazing in the pasture probably can break down cellulose. Excuse your dog when it goes out to eat grass and then throw up. Okay? That doesn't count. But cows, for example, ruminant animals, can digest cellulose. And the reason that they can digest it is because they contain a bacterium in their digestive system that makes cellulase. So they, they contain a bacterium in their digestive system, specifically in their rumen. That's a, that's a four-chambered stomach of ruminants. They contain that bacterium. The bacterium makes cellulase, and they break it down. So cow wants to go out and eat grass. It's getting, ultimately, a lot of glucose from that grass. The next question that arises is, well, what if I got that bacterium myself? Do you want to go eat grass? Well, you might. It might start looking good. I don't know. The answer is that the structure of the rumen okay, allows this bacterium to grow. Our stomach is not structured so as to allow that bacterium to grow. Okay? It takes a, an interesting and unusual environment for that bacterium to grow. We don't have that ability. So it, it would not be a simple matter of having us make cellulase to do that. Could we use genetic engineering to put cellulase into an organism to do that? Could I make my dog make cellulase? The answer is you probably could. But I'd like you to think about, for a moment, that lactose intolerance. And think about where you might be making that cellulase in the wrong place and how flatulent that dog might be. If anybody who have dogs know how flatulent dogs can be, think how bad that might, might turn out. Anyway, you got a question. Uh, like we were talking about with the lactose intolerance, you can maybe like give somebody a pill with lactose in it. Can you do it with cellulase? Yeah, can you? Yeah, the cellulase is a fairly finicky enzyme, and it likes that environment of the rumen as well. So um, it's a good question. Um, I, it might be possible to do that, but not all enzymes are stable to be able to do that. So I, I, I would suspect with cellulase, you probably could not do that. Cellulase is of, of a lot of interest because when we talk about biofuels and people want to convert, let's say, grass into gasoline. If you think about it, it makes a lot of sense because you can take um, the cellulose out of plants, break it down into glucose, and glucose is a great way to feed bacteria. Bacteria can ferment, they can make ethanol, and ethanol can be used as a fuel.